What would make you really happy today? What would make you really happy today? And don't you dare say a short sermon. I know what you're thinking. All right, I got you. I got your number. You know, the really immature among us would say, well, if I had uh, more money, if I had a new car, if I had a better house, if I could get a new job, if if my kids would obey me, you know, if I could go on a, a nice vacation, you know, the more mature would say something like, well, better relationships, you know, friends, uh, you know, family, uh, meaningful employment, and good health. The most mature among us would say, stupid question. That's just a dumb question. You know, what, you don't ask the question, what would make you really happy? The more focused you are on what will make you happy, the less happy you are. Can't you say amen occasionally? You know, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what that's all about. You know, we're living in an age of self-care. You realize that? I mean, you can't go anywhere without someone talking about self-care. But the reality is that self-care might be making you less healthy and less happy. You know, the more self-absorbed you are, the less happy you become. Self-help isn't always self-help. Now, now look at the screen here. We were not designed to primarily help ourselves, but to contribute to the help and the health of others. Now, the common thought today is, is that you have to work on yourself before you can work on the world, right? And you've got to work on yourself before you can work on the world. You, know, you have to get healthy before you can contribute to the health of others. Now, there may be some truth in that. You know, they, they, they say it's kind of like the oxygen mask. When you're on the plane, they tell you, you know, take your oxygen mask, put it on first, then put your child's on, okay? We get that. There is some truth in that. But, you know, Western culture may have gone way too far in the direction of self-help and self-care and this whole idea of becoming the best version of yourself. There's a real danger that we become self, so self-absorbed and so focused on self-care that we have little time and little energy to make a difference in the lives of other people. That was another good amen spot. Amen. I'm going to start putting it on the screen for you, okay? <laughs> you know, happiness or blessedness of life is not found in the pursuit of happiness. It's not found in the pursuit of blessedness. Rather, happiness and blessedness is a byproduct of the pursuit of something else. That's what we're finding out in this series. That as we pursue these other things, blessedness, happiness, just kind of becomes a byproduct. And so far, we've looked at three things. We've looked at righteousness. As we pursue righteousness, living right before God, living right before others, then all of a sudden, we're, as we're doing that which is right, we become this, this tree that's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, whatever it does, prospers. And then we talked about the whole idea of forgiveness because we don't always walk righteously, do we? You know, sometimes we fall short of that righteousness, but there is this inexhaustible supply of forgiveness, God's grace and his forgiveness. And so we live constantly in the fact of our forgiveness, not the feelings because they come and go, but the fact remains the fact. We are forgiven. And so we live in righteous, pursuing righteousness. We, we pursue this life of living under the fact of our forgiveness. And then the last message I preached, we talked about this whole idea of trust. We pursue trusting the heart of the Father, even when we can't understand the hand of the Father. We don't understand why God does what he does or doesn't do what he doesn't do. You know, we're like, we, we can't always understand God's hand, but we constantly are understanding God can be trusted. He's a good, good father. And so we pursue this continual spirit of trust. So righteousness and forgiveness and trust, it leads to a blessedness of life. And now today we come to the, the fourth that I want to point out to you. This, this fourth holy hint on how to be happy is that helping the helpless as we make the focus of our life helping the helpless now here's the sermon in a sentence the fastest way to help yourself is to help someone else hey I heard an amen good job you're getting better at it you know to help the fastest way to help yourself is to help someone else or the fastest way to make yourself happy is to make someone else happy 
Now, I want to tell you the story behind the psalm. It's a really interesting story behind this psalm of David in Psalm 41. David is writing about a time of sickness in his life. I mean, serious sickness. He's on his deathbed. This is a bad time. And he's also writing about a time of betrayal that happened to coincide at the same time. His son Absalom, whom he loved, he loved Absalom. His son Absalom, whom he loved, had murdered his other son because his other son had raped his sister. You thought your family was messed up, huh? David had a messed up family. So after Absalom murders his brother, he has to flee the country. and So he's living in exile. In time, David allows him to come back to Jerusalem, but not into the palace. After another season of time, he allows him to come back into the palace. That's the time that David is sick. David is getting sick. He can't carry out his duties as the king of Israel. And so Absalom begins to plan his coup. He sends one of David's trusted advisors in to check on David to see how he's doing. But all he's doing is getting arsenal that he can use against David. Absalom sets himself up at the, the gateway of Jerusalem. And as people are coming to see the king who is basically incapacitated, he's saying, well, if I were king, if I were king, you could come to me and I would see that you got justice. So this continued and Absalom is building up steam. He's, he's creating, creating people that are willing to follow him. And at just the right time, he plans his coup. David has to flee for his life from the palace. Then, to make himself a stench and to seal the deal, Absalom goes to the top of the palace and he sleeps with David's concubines and wives in the sight of all Jerusalem. Well, a little time goes by. David is able to reorganize and his generals come back and they rout the army of Absalom. Absalom's fleeing from the army, gets his long flowing hair caught in a tree, and he's hanging there by his hair, and one of David's generals comes along and runs him through with a spear. The end of Absalom. That's the story behind the song. David took that time of his life, and he wrote this song about that time in his life. The first thing I want you to see about this psalm is that a blessed life is found in helping the helpless. Now, look at the first phrase. He says, blessed is he who has regard for the weak. Now, he's laying the foundation. Blessed, happy, fulfilled, contented, satisfied is he who has regard for the weak. The full gamut of what it means to be blessed, satisfied, having God's approval upon you is found in the person who has regard for the weak. Now, David, he demonstrated his concern for weak people throughout his ministry. You know, throughout his life, you see it happening there. He demonstrated uh, his mercy with Saul. He, he demonstrated that Saul, he had a chance to take Saul's life on numerous occasions, and yet he showed mercy instead. Whenever he was running from Saul and he was out in the, the wilderness area, he continually protected shepherds and their flocks. You know, the raiders would come in, and yet David would rise up with his men, and he would protect them. He protected Nabal's uh, herdsmen. David also, whenever he came to the throne, he established a welfare system to where the poor among them would be taken care of. When he heard about Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, whom David and Jonathan had a great relationship. Jonathan died in battle. And when David came to the throne, he says, Is there anyone, is there anyone that I can show favor to of the house of Jonathan? They said, Well, yeah, his crippled boy, Mephibosheth. See, Mephibosheth, when he was fleeing, was dropped as an infant, and it broke his ankles, and so he was crippled from then on. David found out about Mephibosheth. He said, bring him to the palace, and he gave Mephibosheth a seat at the king's table for the rest of his life. David was constantly showing favor to people. He even allowed Absalom, his exiled son, to return to Jerusalem, and then even to the palace itself. Now, this phrase there, regard for the weak, now, it's, it's an important word there. It's actually an accounting word. It means that you, you take a serious look. 
has regard, looks carefully like, like an, an analyst would. So in other words, David didn't ignore the weak. He didn't turn the other way. He didn't try to hide from them. What other people ignore, you know, weak people, even today, people ignore the weak. David paid careful attention to them. He saw the value in them. He saw the value in those that, that couldn't take care of themselves, and he considered them his responsibility. That's what it means to regard the weak. It means, hey, they're my responsibility. They can't take care of themselves. It's up to me to take care of them. He saw them as an opportunity, not as a distraction, not as a hindrance to his life, but as an opportunity to serve God and those who bore the image of God. That's what it means to have regard for the weak. The word weak would be those people that truly can't help themselves. They're, they're at the mercy of someone else. David said that blessed are those who have regard, who, who pay attention, who see other people as their responsibility. Now, can I be honest with you? Let me just kind of open up and tell you here. After 40 plus years in ministry and pastoring and working in churches, I have become a bit cynical. You know, those of us in ministry a long time, uh, we can get cynical about people. You know, I and the churches that I've led, we've been taken advantage of over and over again by the weak. People who claim they can't help themselves. And con artists, they abound they abound. We, we have them come through here every month, and we have to deal with them there in the office, and we're like, yeah, right, and then we find out they went down the street too, and then we found out they went over to Grass, they went over to Raycab. They, I mean, they're just taking from wherever they can to Agape, another ministry of our church, and, so, and it's just, just constant. We get so tired of that. And there's this, this spirit of entitlement that is pandemic in our nation today. We've created a welfare state where people think that since I'm alive, since I'm alive, then you owe it to me, all the necessities of life. I'm alive. You owe me all the necessities of life and an awful lot of the niceties as well. At the expense of the taxpayers or, or the family members or the church itself. Now, I get it. It's easy to become cynical about the weak. But we can't let ourselves be cynical and callous. We've got to be careful here. We need to cultivate a heart of compassion for the weak. We need to make sure that our help is not hurt, okay? It could easily become hurt, but we also need to run the risk and be willing to run the risk of being taken advantage of. So I want to ask you some questions and kind of do a little introspection. How much regard do you have for the weak? How much regard do you have for the weak? How much help are you providing for the helpless. When was the last time you did something for someone else that they really couldn't do for themselves? Now you realize that this is one of the primary characteristics of a disciple of Jesus. It's an eagerness to do good works. An eagerness to do good work. I mean, throughout the New Testament, we find that we have been saved for the purpose of good works. Paul tells us that God gave himself, Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. And now here's the characteristic, eager to do what is good. I mean, they're on pins and needles. I mean, they're just looking for opportunity. I'm eager. Man, and count me. I'm ready to go. I, I want to do good. Show me something that's good, and I'll do it. The hallmark characteristic of a mature disciple of Jesus, it's not, it's not knowledge. It's not spiritual disciplines. It's not preaching. It's not teaching. You know the hallmark characteristic of a mature disciple of Jesus Christ is? It's love. It's love. That is the hallmark characteristic. In fact, the measure of your love, the measure of the love that you have for others, is the measure of the love that you have for God. You see, the true measure of Christian maturity and actions are the measure of our love. Do you love God? You say, yes, I love God. Do you love people? Well, there's her problem there. No, 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 no. The, the quantity of your love for people is the quantity of your love for God. It's inseparable. 
In Matthew 25, Jesus told the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know the the story very well. There he's dividing out the sheep from the goat, the distinguishing characteristic of the sheep. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick and in prison, you visited me. And, And what did they say? When did we do that? When did we do that? He kept saying, me, 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 me. And he said, when did we do that? And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. You see, we need to learn to see Jesus in every helpless, hurting person we encounter. When you see a helpless, hurting person, you're seeing Jesus. Do you have regard for Jesus? Or do you ignore Him? That image of God in the person, do you say, it's not my responsibility? Or do you say, oh, that's my responsibility? We've really got to stop measuring Christian maturity in terms of Christian disciplines, okay? As important as Christian disciplines are, we can't use that as a primary measure of our spirituality. Religious behavior, church attendance, quiet times, fasting, praying, giving, teaching, preaching, they are a very poor substitute for having regard for the weak. You know, we, you can have all that and not have regard for the weak, and you just nullified all of that. Let me show you what I mean. Israel. Israel was religious. You want to talk about religiosity, all you had to do was go to Jerusalem in that day, and you would have seen religion, religious behavior, church attendance. You, you saw all kinds of things that were going on. You had daily prayers. You had offerings. You had scripture memory. You had pr- appropriate dress. You had ceremonies, dietary laws, ceremonial laws, Sabbath observances, periods of fasting. They were religious people, very religious But hear God's response to their spiritual disciplines and religiosity. He says to Isaiah, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. He said, Isaiah, I want you to get loud. I don't want you to whisper what you're about to whisper. I want you to stand up in the assembly and I want you to shout this. I want you to amplify it. Here's what he said was, was to say. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near. I mean, so, so he's saying, look, they're religious. They're, they're doing all the behaviors that need to be done. I mean, week after week after week, it's there. It's a show on the outside. But then he says, They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near. They say, Why have we fasted and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? In other words, man, haven't you seen what we're doing, God? Haven't you listened to us sing? Haven't you seen our worship and sacrifice and the offerings? Haven't you seen the way we dress and how we wash our hands and all that stuff? Haven't you seen that? Why aren't you answering our prayers? God says, Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it not for only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and do not turn away from your own flesh and blood. 
Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry for help, and He will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spin yourself, spin yourself in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. God forbid that we would be guilty of religion without regard for the weak. You see, that was Israel's problem. They had religion, but they had no regard for the weak. I preached this passage, Isaiah 58, back in 2011. Someone came to me after the first service. I couldn't remember when I preached it. They came and said, here it is, right here, Pastor. I put the date right there, 2011, you preached this sermon. And out of this sermon, we began doing Feed My Starving Children. Many of you, most of you have probably participated in that. In the years that we have been doing that, at the, at the next completion, we have another one coming up in seven, September. When we complete that one, we will have prepared 10 million meals 10 million meals I mean we could have fed everybody in New York City okay that, that that's how many uh, you know they don't even have 10 million but it's close to that and, and, and God has blessed us you know I can correlate some of the refreshment and the blessings of God both financially and spiritually and, and, and relationally and all that stuff back to 2011 with the advent of that ministry. We got this one coming up. It'll cost us 170000 That's what it'll cost us to put this one on. And, and we've got about 70000 so we need 100000 in the next few weeks. So, hint, hint, hint. Okay. Uh, you don't know this, but our benevolence team this past two weeks ago sent uh, funds to Haiti again. We, we got a call that there were 500 prisoners there in Petaguave where, where we minister that the, the blockades had, had kept. The gangs are blocking food coming from Port-au-Prince to Petaguave and to the, uh, to the prison there. And so they're saying they're, they're hungry and we need help. And so we were able to send funds and those prisoners are now being fed. Uh, every day of the school year, 200 children are being fed because of the provision that we're making uh, available to them. Uh, every time we take of the Lord's table, you guys bring perishable, uh, non-perishables and we pile it up over here and we take it down to RACAP and then we bring in financial offerings and those are distributed to world hunger around the world. We're doing a lot as a church. I still think we can do more and we are considering some more things right now, even meeting tomorrow on some avenues of continued work of, of helping the weak in our world. But the question is, What are you doing? What are you doing as an individual? Is your life filled with regard for the weak? Or is it consumed with self-help and self-care? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's easy to preach on this. It's really complicated to apply it. It really is difficult. How do you help? When is help hurt? Who are you going to help? When is help enabling irresponsibility? You know, the Bible does say if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat, okay? So, so yeah, there, there's a lot of things that we have to figure out. Let me give you just a few guiding principles for regarding the weak. Just a few, okay? Number one, be proactive rather than reactive. You know, I've learned in all these years with ministry, those that are asking for help usually aren't helpable. But those who won't ask for help, those are the ones you can help. Now, think that through. That means that you have to be observant. That means you have to be watching. It means you have to be listening to the Holy Spirit as He is opening up your eyes to people that are truly in difficult situations. And then you respond. Number two, be responsible for necessities but not niceties. You know, we're responsible for food and clothing and shelter, medicine, sometimes transportation, sometimes communication. Those are all basic necessities of life in our day and time. We're not obligated to go beyond that, okay? 
So we provide for, for necessities, not niceties. Number three, when in doubt, run the risk of being taken advantage of. When in doubt, run the risk of being taken advantage of. Better to be too generous than to be too stingy, right? And then fourth, when in doubt, or number fourth, help and then evaluate. Help and then evaluate. Do they express gratitude? You know? Now, we don't do it so they'll say thank you, but thank you does tell us an awful lot about their hearts. So, so help and then evaluate. Do they respond responsibly? Was this a handout or was it truly a help up for them? Now, this is, we're not obligated to continue giving when the giving does not result in responsible living. Some of you parents need to hear that. You're not responsible to keep giving when your giving is not resulting in responsible living. Okay, we have covered the first half of the first verse. We have an entire chapter to go, okay? <laughs> Here's number, number two. And I only have two points, okay? Helping the helpless brings help to the helper. Now, that's what David is really getting at in this chapter. That helping the helpless brings help to the helper. Pretty much sums up the rest of the chapter. When we live a life of regard for the weak, God has an incredible regard for our lives. Now, that's what he's doing. He sets this up. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. And then he flows into all the benefits of that, all the blessedness of having regard for the weak. Look at it there. He delivers us in our times of trouble, verse 1. He protects our lives, verse 2. He preserves our lives, verse 2. He blesses us in the land, verse 2. He sustains and restores us when we get sick, verse 3. He doesn't surrender us to the desires of our enemy, verses 5 through 9. Now, David had enemies, and those enemies, they, they wanted him dead. The, the coffee room conversation was, when is this guy going to die? I wish he would just die so we could erase the memory of his name from the earth. That was what they were constantly talking about. And, and so people were coming to David under the guise of genuine concern and care for David, and they weren't looking for for. for comforting David. They were just wanting information so they could slander him. Let me read to you a little bit more of the text. Verse 5, he says, My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? When everyone comes to see me, he speaks falsely, while in his heart he gathers slander. Then he goes out and he spreads it abroad. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, A vile disease has beset him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, David is hurting here. He's, he's sick. He's, he's, he can't function properly. And, and, and all these people are coming, even his trusted advisor. This trusted advisor was probably a guy by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba, okay? The grandfather. And he was a very wise man. He gave really good counsel. But... Apparently, he still had an axe to grind against David for what he had done to Uriah and to Bathsheba two generations before. And so when he saw David sick, he began feeding information to Absalom. After the coup, it was he that said, hey, take the wives up on the palace and, and become a stench uh, to David. And it was he who said, now, go after him. He's fleeing right now. Go after him, attack him, and kill him while he's disorganized. But Absalom wasn't smart enough to listen to the wisdom. That was the right thing to have done, and Absalom would have won. But he gave David time and his generals time to reorganize. And so the counsel of Ahithophel was thwarted. And as a result, he went out and he hung himself. Does that remind you of any similarities? Judas betrayed Jesus and then went out and hung himself. Ahithophel betrayed David and went out and hung himself. Messianic overturns here in this passage. But here, here's the point I want you to see. There's a direct correlation between our activity in the life of the week and God's activity in ours. Our help in the lives of others appears to be the catalyst of God's help in ours. 
as a church and as an individual, as we spend our lives on behalf of those who are helpless and hurting, God secures such protection and strength and provision for our own lives. So we should live to help others. Living to help others more than others are living to help us. You know, our, God, our goal is to outdo service. It's to see how much good we can do in the lives of the weak among us. You know, the Bible actually tells us, Romans 12, 10, that we are to outdo one another. Our goal is to outdo one another in showing honor and showing care and showing concern. So let me bring you back to the sermon in a sentence. The fastest way to help yourself is to help someone else. The fastest way to help yourself is to help someone else. Now, spa days, you know, they're, they're, they're wonderful. Vacations, they're, they're good things. Moments of mindfulness are helpful. Go get you a massage, an exercise, uh, eat right, drink lots of water, take long walks outside. All that stuff is good. Self-care is okay. But the fastest way to help yourself is to help someone else. Now, can I meddle for a moment? Here's what the flesh, your sinful flesh, is saying. Let me see if I can ping you for a moment here. If you're like me, and you have a sinful flesh like I have, you're thinking, but pastor, I don't have time. Ouch. Or you're thinking, pastor, I don't have the resources to help anyone else. Or you're thinking, I need to help myself before I can even think about helping someone else. Or you're thinking, people should help themselves. Why should I help them? I've worked hard to get where I'm at. Why should I have to help someone else? They need to work hard. It's probably because they're making mistakes and they're not living responsibly. Or you're thinking, I don't want to enable bad behavior. And look, your sinful flesh will justify stinginess like that. We're good at justifying stinginess. Don't let it happen to you. Have regard, careful analysis of the weak, those that are truly helpless and hopeless. In John chapter 13, verse 15, Jesus is bringing his life ministry to an end. And he's communicating some of the most important things. You know, you always kind of wait till the end to really drive home some of the points that you want to uh, make sure that people don't miss. Jesus knew they had to get this one down. They had to get this one down and really understand it. So after supper, he got up, he took his outer cloak off, and he got a towel, and he wrapped it around himself. And he got a, a bowl, and he got a basin of water. And he walked around one by one, and he washed the dirty feet of the disciples. You know that story. He saw something that needed to be done that no one else wanted to do, and he did it. And when he finished, listen to what he said. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, now that you know these things, now that you know these things, now that you know the things of Psalm 41, now that you know the truths of Isaiah 58, now that you know the truth of John chapter 13, he says, you will be, do you know what the next word is? Blessed. Blessed. Blessed if you do them. Would you bow with me for a moment? I want you to ask the Father to give you eyes to see the dirty feet around you. You say, Lord, let me see dirty feet. Help me to see the needs that are around me, the needs that no one else wants to tend to. Show me the dirty feet. 
Ask him, Father, would you, would you open my eyes to the weak? Show me who are the weak. Show me those that are truly helpless and hopeless that are in my sphere of influence. And Lord, if you'll show me the weak, then Lord, I will love them with the same love that I have for you. Father, these are, are life-changing truths that need to be embraced by all of us. Lord, when you walked upon the earth, you had eyes to see the crippled, the lame. You had eyes to see the hungry and the hurting. You had eyes to see the sick, the lepers. Lord, I pray that we would not be a church that just sings beautiful songs and cultivates spiritual disciplines and dispenses truth without having a regard for the weak. Lord, I pray that as we go out, that, Lord, each one of us would take this on as our responsibility. That, Lord, as we go out into this world of hurting people, that, Lord, we would say, yes, my church is doing a lot, but I need to do something as well. So, Lord, open our eyes. If you'll show them to us, then, Lord, we'll respond. Thank you for the time of worship today. Lord, I pray that it's pleasing in your sight. Because it's not just songs. It's not just words. It's not just activities. But, Lord, it's all the, the, uh, the catalyst for us then to go out and make a difference. To love you by loving others. In the great name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah. If you need to talk with somebody, they're here at the front. You need someone to pray with you. You have clarifications. You'd love to uh, talk about the message. These folks, they're, they're experts. They can tell you everything you need to know, okay? Grace and peace be with you.